Welcome to the Backyard Bouquet Podcast, where stories bloom from local flower fields and home gardens. I'm your host, Jennifer Galizia of The Flowering Farmhouse. I'm a backyard gardener turned flower farmer located in Hood River, Oregon. Join us for heartfelt journeys shared by flower farmers and backyard gardeners. Each episode is like a vibrant garden, cultivating wisdom and joy through flowers. From growing your own backyard garden to supporting your local flower farmer, the Backyard Bouquet is your fertile ground for heartwarming tales and expert cut flower growing advice. All right, flower friends, grab your gardening gloves, garden snips, or your favorite vase because it's time to let your backyard bloom. Hello, flower friends, and welcome to a very special episode of the Backyard Bouquet as we celebrate Mother's Day this week. Today, we're joined by an extraordinary guest, Camille Selleck of Camille's Flowers. Camille's journey into the world of flowers is not just a story of passion, but a poignant narrative of healing and transformation. From a life centered around cooking and hospitality to finding solace in the soil of her garden after a profound personal loss, Camille's tale is one of discovering new beginnings and unexpected places. Located in the lush Pacific Northwest, Camille's Flowers specializes in all things dahlias. Camille has been nurturing a vibrant array of blooms and has dedicated herself to the art of dahlia hybridization for several years, creating unique and beautiful varieties. She has cultivated a space not just to grow flowers, but to nourish souls, much like a wholesome meal shared with loved ones. As we honor mothers and all they do this week, Camille stands out as a remarkable example of motherhood, balancing life as a business owner, educator, homeschooling mom. She embodies the spirit of nurturing and growth. Her story reminds us of the resilience and nurturing power of all mothers and how they help us bloom in countless ways. Camille, it's such a pleasure to have you joining us on the show today. Can you please share how you got your start in flower farming? Yeah, thanks for having me as well, Jen. So I appreciate that. Um, So I got into flower farming. It was actually one of, it was through grief and loss. So we had um, just moved into a five acre farmhouse and um, I've always had dreams of being able to just do vegetables, right? And because before we lived in a condo and so all of the gardening was in pots, right? It was in I can relate. And so, um, so then that's what we, what I did. And it was the summer that we moved in there. My, um, my older brother, he died of a heroin overdose. And oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, and, um, so it was 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years ago this summer. And, um, I, so I always loved to cook and bake. Um, when I was in home ec, I did like three years of home ec back in the day. And I, it w- I could be I, I would prefer not to do sewing and all that, but I loved to cook and whatnot. And that carried me through and I taught cooking classes. I had a blog for many years on hospitality and cooking and all of that. Well, once he died, I just, um, I couldn't cook really. It was one of those things where just something, you know, just washing dishes and I would cry and, um, and in deep sobs, it, it like the grief was big and my girls were all little. So I have three daughters and my youngest was, had just turned two. So then that would have meant my others were five and seven. Um, and so it was just, oh yeah, it was a lot of hard times and I still planted a, like a garden and I did all of that. And I just, yeah, I couldn't cook. And I just found like this lack of joy. I remember I always equate it to, I had a dog and she lost her puppies and she was a beagle Mm. known for their cute little ears. And they just, they perk up and you just look at them and they're so cute. But once she lost her puppies, her ears never perked up. They just always sat back. Oh, Like you could just tell. Um, And that's kind of how it felt. Like I just, this thing that I used to love wasn't there anymore. Like I couldn't do it. And I like, and so it was probably, I don't know, maybe two, like a year later, I think, where um, I picked up four dahlias at our local um, 
in town um, garden is this really cool place called Joe's Garden here in Whatcom County in Bellingham. And um, I didn't know what to do. Um, I had had, we had the back garden, but I was, um, we had had chickens and I thought chickens, um, I'm not meant to be a chicken farmer. So I got rid of the chickens, but all this, this pasture area was full of rich nitrogen poop, you know, from the, Uh I was like, this will be great to plant some corn and some zucchini and some squash. And, you know, we could, we could plant some dahlias. We could plant like four, like four. So, um, that was the goal. And it was a nice, it was a nice patch. Um, so I call up a friend or from church and um and I said, "Hey, I know you you grow dahlias. What do I do?" Now she is like of um she is a hard working lady. She's a little bit older than me and she's she's German. I can still hear her voice. She's like, "I'll be right over." And she <sighs> just like comes over. She's like, "And I have some more for you." So she comes over with more dahlias. And she just shows, and at this time, I'm homeschooling all three of the girls, and or at least the older two, and she sh- tells us, you know, dig a hole, put the tuber in, put a stick in there so you know where you did it, and then, you know, cover it up. And so there's me and my my like little two-year-old, and I'm saying, great job, you're doing such a great job, and, you know, and just paying attention to them, and we're going at a snail's pace. And I look, or I turn around, and I see that um, my acquaintance friend has planted the whole field full of dahlias. It's just like full <laughs> of dahlias. And I was like, oh, I guess we're not make we're not gonna grow zucchini or corn, or I guess we're not doing this. I guess it's gonna be this. Because there was no room for the other stuff. And so I I thought, well, might as well just submit to it, right? Like just do it. So then I went and got some more flowers and stuff. And then what I realized in that, um, because I never really liked planting flowers. Um, I thought they were like a waste, honestly, because they wouldn't like feed my family. So why plant flowers, you know, aside from like some calendula or whatever, some stuff. And, um, and it was in that moment, like that summer that I realized like what my, what my soul needed, like my soul needed to be fed. Yes. And so instead of like my, our bellies, it was like, so it became this sanctuary of a place for me, um, for healing and so those four dahlias got multiplied just by sheer <laughs> of this friend who like planted them all. Um, unfortunately, like I lost every single one. It was one of those oh, like, no. you, you, cause you dig them up and there was no names, you know, cause it's like the first time you're like, oh, they're pretty. And you don't realize that they have names and then you leave them out on the porch and uh, not realizing that a frost came overnight. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I have to go buy more. So then that's what like, you know. From then, and it just kind of stuck. And then, you know, you know, like any person, you're like, well, we could expand this. Just a few more. Yeah. (laughs) So that's kind of how the process went um, to to, that I started growing Dahlia. So it was really like soul care. And so that's why I feel like what even like my presence online, like I feel like there is it's like creating space, um, cultivating space for our souls to breathe. And that's more important to me than being um this grandiose money maker. <laughs> I love that. I don't know if you know Christy Purifoy. She was on yes. the podcast and we had a long discussion about how flowers are not selfish because they feed the soul. And mm-hmm. I it just reminded me of that when you said that and how true that really is, especially when we're in times of grief. And I love that even though you were in a really hard time in your life, you included your children. Mm-hmm. in that process. And I mean, your friend was planting those seeds or those tubers for you, but at the same time, you were planting seeds, I imagine, with your children as well. Mm-hmm. Do your yeah. daughters enjoy gardening with you? Not really. Um, yeah, Mine so doesn't now, either. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't. Like, So my oldest is 17 and my middle's 15 and then 11. So um, yeah, they, they don't. I, it's more of a, they each have different personalities, right? Like we have kids with different personalities and my oldest is probably my one where I can come out, she'll come out and she'll she'll remember the names with me. I'm like pretty good at remembering all of my Dahlia names as well. Um so she'll say like, "Oh, this one. Oh, you know, like so she'll um she's my take it in with me and enjoy it and have conversations in the garden." In my middle, she's more of a like 
I'll help you with some stuff, you know? And then my youngest, she's pretty carefree and whimsical. Um, she actually just helped at our our county, our Whatcom County Dahlia tuber sale. So that like she, you know, she's just but she picked out two tubers that she could plant for herself. So Oh, I yeah. love that. So there's some interest there. We'll see. We'll see. She likes to she's yeah, we'll see. I some don't budding interest, maybe. Well, yeah. I, I don't put too much uh I don't yeah, put too much stock on on it. But if Well, I love to. that you're not forcing anything on them. How do you nurture those relationships. I have a single child. I have a daughter. And at first I had all these grandiose ideas that she was going to be out in the garden with me all the time. And I don't force it. There's times that she comes out and we have fun, but for the most part, she'd rather be playing with her friends or reading a book than being in the garden. So, and you have three daughters. So I imagine they're all very different personalities and unique as well. How do you foster those relationships with them? Or is there anything that you do to introduce them to the garden without forcing it on them? Um, you know, it's, it's ebbed and flowed. Um, so when they were younger, they were more, I think it's like when, when kids in general are younger, they're just a little bit more, they have that wonder about them, uh-huh. that, um, which I, cause I love kids. I, I love working with kids and some of my favorite memories are having, um, kids into the garden and um, like one of my dear friends um, after they left the garden like left my garden this was years ago and she said oh mom Miss Camille is like the flower fairy you know and I, I was like that. oh I love and so I just I love kids being in the garden it's kind of like teaching them how to handle it you know to that um, to to take it in, it's kind of like how to savor it, like how you savor a meal. And you just, it's like, to me, it's like a glimpse of heaven. And like, we like screenshot these moments. And so how do we savor this? And you're teaching kids. And I I noticed like even the most rough and tumble can sit there and just like be gentle, you know? And how do we do that? Like, and so it's like flowers and puppies and babies, right? Like we we know this thing, like, oh, we have to be a little gentle here. Um, and I, I love the fact that a whole, f- like a, that a, a, the whole point of a flower is actually to die so that more life will come from it mm. and more life will be resurrected from it. And so like once it actually gets into that beautiful stage, we know that it's going to die soon actually out in the garden and then, but it produces seed for more life to keep happening. And so like, I, I like, just like that type of stuff. I know it's a, a different, different what you had asked, but I guess I think like showing that, like kind of pointing out those things, those deeper things of what the garden actually means. And you gave so, me goosebumps describing that. That's yeah, a really like, beautiful metaphor of what yeah. our gardens are. Well, because like, especially my personal story of like, there's, there's graves and gardens, right? Like there's mm-hmm. grief and there's joy. Like we don't know joy unless we know grief. And so I think about that, like in losing my brother and seeing that life is always like there is resurrection in life, you know, in death, there is that. And so just seeing that and pointing that out, I think for my daughter is like to keep pointing to that because there's always going to be suffering. There's always going to be sorrow and they've encountered it and they haven't encountered it to the extreme that um, others have. But knowing that like we just like there's always but flowers will keep blooming. Like life will keep going on, but so will death. Like they come, they go together. So I don't know. Um, I foster a relationship with my daughters to see each of them individually just, and I think that's why I love dahlias because there's so many different types and, um, why, like I, 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 I kind of had my, like, I guess, fame to claim or claim to fame. Is that the word? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, was with Coralie and Castle Drive when I recognized, I was like, these two aren't, aren't the same flower. Like it's not the same. And I have a pretty good, like, it's because I believe that each person has their own story and their, their own individual and that we can't like, it isn't one size fits all. And so just as I see that with dahlias, like this is this with this form, with this size, like this is what makes this one unique. 
And then this is what makes this one unique. And they might even share like the same form, but they're different. And so the same thing with my daughters is that I take it as my job to really study them and to get to know them and to know like that one needs a back rub. The other just needs me to be quiet. The other needs me to, you know, so like those things, I try to make sure that I always like touch, like give good touch every day to each one of my girls. And every time they go to bed, I say, I, I, I say a, um, a prayer over them. It's the same one for every single one of them. But I like even use that to pause myself to like remember what it is. So the, the, we're not, it's not just like saying words. Sure. Um, but that's like my goal is that when I was laying in bed, this is years ago at our old place because we moved. Um, I remember the question I said, I thought, oh, that I heard was, at the end of your life, will you regret? What would you regret the most? Not like mm-hmm. breeding dahlias, not doing this or what. And it was like, without a doubt, I would regret if I didn't invest in my daughters and in my husband and put something else above them. And so I just knew that like, yeah, that I just right then and there, like I, 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 cause I, my goal is that they would want to come back home. I like love that. that. Yeah. That's really beautiful. I really love how you talk about these seeds that you're planting in your daughters. And what's really neat is you have this parallel going on in your life. You are breeding dahlias and you're also raising these three beautiful daughters at the same time. I know our audience, many of them love growing dahlias. Can we touch a little bit on your passion and love and experience in breeding dahlias? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's um, breeding dahlias. It's like my my little three seedlings, right? My my girls, and then yes. these other ones. So um, I'm into my I'm going into my fifth season of with breeding, um, and so gosh, there's so much that you could say about breeding breeding dahlias, right? Absolutely. Um, I. So I happen to be very fortunate to be part of a society, a Dahlia society, where I have some long time hybridizers in it. So um, people like Steve and Sandy Boley of Birch Bay Dahlias, they've bred all of the Sandia, the Irish, um, SB, and there's other ones where they don't have those um, prefixes. So, and they... I would say that they're probably some of the best hybridizers in the world. I really like, I, I, I would say that because I know what they're doing um, is I think that they have the biggest rainbow of hybridizing in every single field. And, um, and so it's really great to be able to like learn under them. Uh, we have people like Paul Bloomquist as well, um, Jean Heringa and uh, Corey Wynn and her husband, uh, her late husband, Walt. Um, so people like that, Glenn Gitz, he's Gigi, he's related to the Swan Island people. So there's just oh. these great, great people who have done, you know, so like, for instance, the Bullies, they've been doing it for 30 years. And wow. so I really believe in mentoring very strongly um, I believe in community very strongly. And one thing I, I think that I would recommend is like, I guess if I were to like, if someone's like wanting to start hybridizing is as much as um, it's, it's easier and it feels safer to pop onto a Facebook forum and ask questions, but it's more risky and more vulnerable to get to know a person and ask them those questions in person. So if you have someone in person that you can actually ask, I would go that route just because I am a very firm believer in um, that we can only go so deep online and especially forums. It's just a little bit harder um, because there's so much noise, I think. Um, Absolutely. and, And I think it goes back to like how I view like, seeing each person individually and like knowing them and knowing their story. Um, So that would be my first thing. Like if there's a Dahlia society in your area, like 
get to know them. And sometimes you have to do like hard work. Like you can't expect to just show up and someone to give you all the answers. And I've, I've read different people in the past where they said like, you know, these hybridizers, they keep all their secrets and, um, you know, behind closed doors. And some of the people who have said that, um, haven't taken the chance, haven't risked themselves to going to clubs and getting to know those people. Um, because just as like you or I, you know, like me being almost like I'm almost 45 or some teenager or some 80 year old, we all don't want to be used. We don't want someone to come in and say like, be our friend just so that they can get something out of it. So like I've been a part of my club for, I don't know, seven or eight years now. And it's taken me a while to really get in because some of these people have been a part of this club for like 40 years, 30 to 40 years. And so like, yeah, I don't know, 20, I guess, maybe 20 to 30 years. And so it's just harder. It's a little bit harder, right? And there's that big generation gap. Um, But I think if we put forth the energy and the time to get to know, then we can like just value these people. And then like, I know, for instance, like Steve and Sandy, they're more than willing to share their information. Um. You know, I like appreciated hearing Sandy say, you know, I, ha- I have 30 years in my head of breeding. I don't want it to die with me. I want mm-hmm. to have a legacy. And there are those who are more secretive. Well, they'll find the people who aren't. So I guess that would be my first thought um, of of building relationships, trying to do that. Camille, you are sharing such great advice and information. And it's amazing how much of it parallels back and forth between parenting and nurturing any sort of relationship. I do want to pause for a second. When you were talking about club memberships, for anyone listening, if you're not familiar, Camille is referencing the American Dahlia Society, which is actually how I got to meet you in person was last year. It was my first time attending the convention, the national convention, because it was held in Portland, Oregon, and you traveled down from Washington. And I found it so amazing to see how vast the age groups are. Everyone from, I'm going to venture to say people in their 20s to people in their 80s who are still showing dahlias came out to this. And so it is a vast community with so much knowledge. Can I ask, Camille, what Dahlia Society are you a part of? Oh, yeah. I'm part of Whatcom County Dahlia Society. And you're located where in Washington? Bellingham, Washington. And Bellingham. And so yeah. what growing zone is that? That is eight. Well, so I think it's 8A because we okay. have little microclimates here. Sure. So you've touched on the importance of having a mentor mm-hmm. if you're going to breed dahlias, which I think is so wonderful. I've had the opportunity to talk to a few members in my club that have been breeding dahlias also in the Portland one. And I wish I'm an hour about an hour and 20 minute drive away from our club. So I can't make the meetings very often, unfortunately, but it is a goal of mine to try and make them more this year. And it's super affordable to be in the Dahlia societies. It's what, like $10 a year. Something cheap. You you get access to all the tuber sales also that they do through the clubs, which I think is what you were referencing. You went to this last weekend. I was in charge of our wholesale. So, Oh my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, after after talking a little bit more about the breeding dahlias, maybe we could touch on that also. I wanted to know, I w- well, I would love to know, how did you get started breeding dahlias? Um, yeah, I think, so I started breeding dahlias before everyone started doing it, right? Like, um, I think once Christine Albright wrote her book, and then once... Um, Florette released Discovering Dahlias. Like they was got released around the same time. And then COVID hit and everyone started breeding dahlias after that. <laughs> like yes. it just became this, um, well, everyone started growing dahlias really. So um, it's just, I think it was a perfect storm. Like whereas before to breed dahlias, there was more, um, like people didn't just jump right into it. And I think that's what I'm seeing is a little different is people um, are just jumping not, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's the jump is more quick. 
because they're seeing it more. It's it's just like social media. So you're seeing this again. That's like my whole thing is like, just because you see everyone doing these other things doesn't mean that maybe you should be doing it yet. Or maybe it is like, it's really finding your passion and, and narrowing in on it. So, um, yeah, so I started mainly because I think I was curious about it and I'd read about it. Um, we have a, like a, you know, just, I'm, I was surrounded by hybridizers, right. You know, I'm like, so how do you do this? Like, like, what is this like? And so even learning the fact that a Dahlia is an octoploid, that it has eight sets of chromosomes, you know, like there's it's eight so chromosomes. It's so wild to me. And so it's like, okay, that's crazy. Um, and so just understanding, like, I was so fascinated. Like, um, I liken it to the fact that I never drank wine before because I thought it was really gross. And I'm a type of person, once I understand the process, so my husband, this is long before we had kids, and he said, hey, I, I want to sign us up for a wine tasting class. And um, I am very sensate. Like, I like the, the taste, the smell. Like, I have an amazing sense of taste. And so we took the class, and I was like, oh, this is how it works? You mean the flavors I'm tasting? I mean, this is... I didn't know that they didn't add those flavors because I had no idea, right? Like it's when meanwhile, probably some like wine snob is like, oh, oh, oh foolish girl. So um, yeah, so I, like once I understand the process, I'm very intrigued because I want to know like, oh, this is so amazing um, mm-hmm. because I'm just more curious. Like I think I'm naturally curious and I want to understand it. Um, and so once I learned that, I wanted to be able to um, – you know, like try it, but I didn't try it. I didn't start off big. I collected just a couple seeds. I knew the seed parent. And so like, that was one of the things that I was taught, um, with, um, uh, from like Paul and from the bullies, like is to know your seed parent. So, um, uh, of course I didn't, I didn't hand cross or anything like that. So I at least knew like one seed parent. And so, Uh Yeah. And then I just, that's how I started, but I started really small, you know, just to see. And so those blooms, um, I, so I collected the seed the year before COVID. And so COVID what like that COVID summer 2020 was when they started to bloom, which was such a gift because you're stuck at home and to like see brand new seedlings that you had never seen before start to pop up. And I, you know, and I thought they were the most beautiful thing in the world, even though they weren't, you know, like a kid at Christmas. Oh, well, it's like seeing your newborn, like you're the only one, like this smushy little thing. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful face I've ever seen in my life. Same thing with the, with the dahlias. Yes. You're like, oh, isn't that? And then like looking back, I'm like, that's not good. We we get rather attached to them because they are yeah, ours totally. and they're unique. Yeah. Um, so, so you started with your own seed on breeding dahlias. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got hooked um, with Florette's release book um, because it came with a packet of seeds. And I remember seeing those. It was 2021, I think, when I grew my first seeds. And I don't have any of those seeds left. Um, but after that, I was like, I could save my own seeds. Yeah. So you mentioned that yours were open pollinated. For those listening, can you describe the two ways that seeds can get pollinated for breeding? Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's the, and there's different methods even within that. So um, for instance, I'm focusing in on water lilies. So I've separated all my water lilies away from the main garden so that, um, because bees are highly efficient, so they're doing the work, but they're at least 50, 50 feet um, away from the rest of the patch. But you can do open pollination, um, basically let the bees do their work, and then how you decide to organize that, like me, like separating by separation. Um, you could even choose to set, arrange your field because bees do tend to just go down a row one because they're efficient. They want to be right. efficient. So they're not going to do this zigzaggy and move, move every which way. So generally it's like, if you're, if your goal, well, so that's what I would say first is right. Is what are your goals? Like to really be a hybridizer, like is that you would have goals and you'd be keeping track um, versus just gathering seed and, and seeing what you get. Like, that's just what, 
what Steve and Sandy would say is you're seed takers, you're not hybridizers. Um, oh, I like that terminology. Yeah, right. Because hybridizers are truly looking at the genetics and making sure that they don't get inbreeding happening. And so they're really aware of what's happening. Um, or you could do like Christine Albright. She does a lot of hand um, hand pollination. So then she's going to be covering the blooms with like a organza bag of the two that she wants. Or you might even, you know, so like that would be, that would be another method to go about. Um, you know, so again, though, if you're really, if you have any open centers, though, like from collarettes to mini, uh, mignette singles to even anemones, anemones are actually open centers. Um, if you don't want open centers, then the best thing you would do is is to eliminate any open centers in your garden so that you have the higher probability of um, the bees getting fully doubles or whatever it is that you're trying to do. So that's, that's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I learned about water lilies. So if people are interested, I mean, so Sandy Boley is one of the Queens of water lilies. Um, her and Margaret Kennedy of Holly Hill. They're the yes. water, like, so Ted does other ones, but it's really Margaret who does the water lilies and Sandy really does the water lilies. Um, and if you've ever seen a, 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 a water lily from her, so they're all Sandia, um, they're, they have this beautiful cupping. It's a, it's, you know, and so it's also knowing the difference between what's show quality and what's for cut flower. Um, I would say that her, um, cut flower water lilies for the undiscriminating eye, who's not a, an American Dahlia Society judge, you wouldn't know that it wasn't show quality enough. So like they would call, for instance, Sandia Bliss is not a show Dahlia. Interesting. But it's a cut flower. And so often, and so again, it goes back to goals. So their goal would be to create dahlias that could go to the head table. So they know. So they're breeding for that, right? When and you say so, head table, you mean the head table at the show? At shows, yeah. And so there's certain quality. Like if you know what a judge is looking for, you know that that's what you're going to try to breed for. And so for so um, it, so it's really like understanding. I, I mean, I would. I do think it's really important to um, whether whether someone ever wants to show dahlias. I think that there's some some merit, some actually high merit to going and becoming a clerk at a show and understanding what they're looking for because you're understanding really good, a uh, really beautiful flower. Mm -hmm. And you're understanding it. It's kind of like for me to go as I take that wine, like take that wine tasting class and I'm like understanding, oh, this is the nuance. This is the flavor, right? As the end, at the end of the day is that in, that wine instructor said, hey, if you like two buck chuck from Trader Joe's, then don't let someone who's highbrow let you like say that, that you don't know what you're talking about. Like be, you know, so if what you're going for is the cut flowers, that's fine. What it is, though, is to understand what really high what, what quality is and then going, OK, but but I'm going to do this as well, mm -hmm. you know, and so that you have these goals. And it and it just I think what it does, it's a building a foundation. It's why a pianist should learn how to sight read, even if they have a really great ear to be able to play a piece, because that that ability to sight read will just enhance their piano playing even more. Right. So same thing with cooking, same with any type of discipline is understanding that foundation in order to break rules and to do what it is. So with like water lilies, um, say if I'm trying to have that perfect cupping, well, then I want to uh, like uh, what I've been told is it's like a bell curve. And so knowing that water lilies are historically really crappy tuber, tuber makers. Mm -hmm. So it's being able to find... Um, a water lily that might actually make some good tubers and crossing that with a variety that maybe has is a pretty decent water lily form or has that beautiful cupping and you're crossing that because you're trying to get closer to that the top of that bell curve and you're mm -hmm. and then you're making those records so that you know that you're not um, breeding two assist two sisters together right 
yes. so that and then and then you're so it, I I would say that like that is is like knowing your goals and then breeding towards that bell curve. So like for instance, um, I actually would also like to breed miniature cactus and semi cactus mm. because they're not very widely known. No, and I com- came to find out this weekend actually that um, that happened. There is Bill McLaren, or yeah, Bill McLaren. He did all the Alpen varieties, and um, he's he's passed away since. But he kind of specialized in semi cactus and cactus at that time. And he, when you could when you could um, get seed from Australia, like there was more open um, mm-hmm. sharing at that point. So they he was able to collect seed from I believe the breeder's last name was Williams, and he specialized in palms. So what Bill McLaren did is he crossed a palm with the semi cactus because which you wouldn't think but it makes sense because the palm is small so you're mm-hmm. trying to get that the small part breeding that part out and crossing it with this the form of the semi cactus to eventually get a me- a miniature which means 4 inches or less of a of a semi cactus or cactus so moving towards that bell curve. So just like looking yes. at that, I'm getting all nerdy with you, Jen. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I'm sure that some of our listeners will also be taking lots of notes here and enjoying a lot of this topic as well, because like you said, so many people are getting into it. I mean, I sold out of all of my excess seeds that I had this year with us reducing our field. I had quite a bit of extra seed that I figured at first, I was like, oh, do I share these seeds? And then part of me was like, well, if I share them, at least those dahlias are getting grown and getting out in the world. And hopefully someone will tag me or share it with me if it turns out to be a beautiful new variety mm-hmm. yeah. um, because they were all collected from the dahlias in my breeding patch this last year that performed well. So Nice. I feel like there's so many people that are really loving growing dahlias from seed. There's that element of surprise and curiosity that just, it's like being a kid at Christmas. And it's a really neat time to see so many new varieties coming into the market. Have you had any conversations with some of the breeders that have been around for a while? Do they welcome this many new breeders if someone's wanting to get into it? Or I know you mentioned building those relationships and that's probably the key p- right here is if you want to get into this, don't just expect them to give the knowledge, but how have you built those relationships, I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. Um, I think it's, for me, it's like showing up to the meetings, volunteering, like, um, I think about like, if you have built something, if you've been a part of something for 20, 30 years, you want to ensure that that legacy is going to continue because you believed in it enough to invest that many years in it. And um, when you see that there's other people coming up who are more youthful and they said, yes, like they've shown, they've shown up, they can be like counted on and whatnot. um, Then I think it's just that like knowing like, okay, I can trust you. Like I know that you have the best interest in, at heart for this club, for these people. Um, I appreciate, um, it was, uh, Bob and Teresa Schroeder. They live in Washington state. Um, and they're part of the Northwest Federation of Dahlia Growers. And, um, I was talking with with them at a, at the Whatcom County show in the fall. And, um, but, you know, uh, I remember Bob saying, you know, we, yeah, we go to these shows But you know what keeps us coming back? Sure, the dahlias are great, but it's the relationships. It's the people. And so, and I think that's true. I think people are always more important than things. Dahlias will come and go, but people Mm -hmm. will always be more important. And so it's knowing that, like, it's developing, it's cultivating those relationships with the people. And because if it weren't for the people, I wouldn't want to keep coming back, you know? Um, So... I guess that's it. It's like stepping outside of our comfort zone and cultivating relationships with people. And, um, and then it's super cool because you build these relationships and then you realize you don't have to like fight in all those Dahlia Wars because you're like, Oh, Hey, 
I have friends where I can just like trade tubers and I don't have to go on an ISO Dahlia page looking for them. Because, <laughs> you know, because it's like we just, because at the end of the day, we don't care as much about the Dahlia as we care about the relationships with the people that were, that we, ha- that we share this common interest with, you know? I, I love that. I think for me, part of what I love about growing Dahlias is what you just said, the community. There are so many kind and generous people in the Dahlia world that really, if you think about what are Dahlias doing, they're bringing beauty to the world. They don't really serve any other purpose other than to maybe feed the birds, or I mean the bees and pollinators. But what do they do? They provide beauty. And so those that are growing them are adding beauty into the world. So Mm -hmm. it's a community of people that care, I feel like. And I think that's what keeps me coming back to the Dahlias Mm -hmm. is you're not going to get rich spending all this time growing a small patch of dahlias, but you're going to be rich by feeding your soul. Your soul Mm -hmm. is going to feel fulfilled with this love for the flowers that you get to share with other people. At least that is for me. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some people who like, you know, again, it goes back to who, how you're designed and how you're made. There's some people where they're just naturally efficient and fast workers and man, they can, you know, they can create they can do these things so fast and they probably are more apt to making a lot of money doing this stuff and they're strategic. And, and I'm like, yeah, I am not those things. (laughs) So, and that's okay. Right. Like, but for the most part, it's not going to be like a huge money maker. (laughs) No, it's something that brings joy and beauty to the world, which I think kind of brings us back full circle talking about the motherhood piece of it. You have five acres of land that if you wanted to, you could probably have a massive Dahlia operation, but you have chosen to prioritize your family. So tell us a little bit more before we have to wrap up today. How do you prioritize? I mean, right now we're it's the busy season. This episode's airing in May, right around Mother's Day. Your family is going to want to celebrate you. It's also Dahlia planting season where a million things are happening at once. How do you prioritize everything? I don't want my family to be my opportunity cost. And so for those, if you've ever studied economics, right, you have two choices. Your second choice is your opportunity cost. Um, so I want my, my, we, every yes, we have to have at least a couple no's. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding, it goes back to understanding yourself, knowing how you're hardwired, knowing who you are. Um, And then in that, like, if you know yourself, then you know where your, where your um, pitfalls will be. If you're a person who happens to say yes a little bit too much, then I would encourage, um, you know, being able to like write that stuff out and what can you quit? You know, don't, don't believe the lie that this is my only time. Like I, if I, if I don't do it now, I'll never have a chance. Like that's a lie. So, um, I think that's a huge thing is that I want my yes to, to count and I don't want, um, yeah, I, and I, and as much as I would love to do more or I'd love to be able to, you know, Gosh, Jen, I, I've been doing this for a lot longer than so many other people online. And my, if like, if we were to, if we were to go ahead and look at like my following on Instagram, we'd go like, oh, you must not know anything, you know, like, like my, my, the people who I have mentored far surpass me on followers. But if, if that's where any of us are putting our worth and our identity in, then we're going to always fall short, right? Even the person with like mass amounts, it's always Mm going to fall short. So I, I know that I'm not trying to build that kingdom there. I'm trying, I, that's not my purpose. And so, um, and it's knowing that, um, I've given, I've been given this one life to live. And so how do I live it? Well, I think of my mother-in-law, she passed away six years ago and she was the most wonderful woman. And, um, she worked tirelessly as a nurse serving other people and she would come home and she'd serve her family. And she wrote this letter that we all got to read. And she, in this letter, she wrote about how she's preparing her, 
her um her RV and it was this, you know, rundown thing, but she like delighted in it because she wasn't fancy and flashy. She was humble and meek and loved well. And she, and in that letter, she talked about how here is this, this blanket from Camille. And here was this uh, uh, sleeping bag that was Ben's. That's my husband. And here's this from, you know, so every single person. And she was writing this letter to her daughter, my sister-in-law. And she said, you know, I didn't do many great things in this life. I, you know, and I, I never aspired to be a nurse, but I did it because I knew it would pro- provide for my family. But I, I love your, I loved your dad and I loved you kids. And mm-hmm. I wanted to serve that, to serve him and to love him and love you kids and my grandkids. And so I guess, uh, I lived one wonderful life and everything that she, she named the people, it was the people that were most important. And so for me, that's what I want. And knowing that I have limitations, that we all have limitations and that we don't have to do it all. And what if we just like narrow it in on one thing and we did it really well Mm. versus trying to do it all. Mm -hmm. So like right now I have not started seed. I will. I have not propagated any of my dahlias. I just potted them up this past weekend. When I look online and I see these other people with their luscious, you know, walk-in gorilla tents that I actually bought and I don't even have it filled, I have to give myself grace because I'm growing daughters, like women who will come to me and talk to me about their hard stuff because that's what's more important for me to cultivate. I have an older daughter who has disabilities and I will need to be on point so much more. And that's the lot that like, that's what I've been given, right? And so if I begrudge it, then I will begrudge on them. But if I re- like receive it in its fullness, then I can serve them well and I can serve myself well and serve others well. And so I don't have this timeline of like, oh, I need to hurry and get get like my, my dahlia out there and running on this like, because I'm not running on an economy of this world. And so I don't feel like I need to hurry and get my dahlia seedling out there. I know it will happen. And so I'm running I'm running the race of of the tortoise and not the hare. And that's okay that, with me. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And you're raising some incredible humans at the same time. Yeah, they're great. And some beautiful <laughs> dahlias too. Um with I think it's beautiful how you said that because so many of us and I've been guilty of it too fall under that comparison game where you open up your phone and I used to open my phone every morning while I was drinking my coffee. And now I try and get through my morning. I make my priority list. I don't look at, well, I look at my calendar on my phone, but I don't look at the social media Mm -hmm. piece until I have my day prioritized because otherwise I would open up my phone and I'd see someone has propagated 20 dahlias. And I'm like, oh no, I better go do this. Or I better go start some seeds when no, that's not what my priorities needed to be that day. Yeah. So that's a really beautiful lesson that you shared with all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you know, what I would add, Jen, is like you just said, yeah, this other person propagated all this and doing this. And um, I like one thing I try to do because I, I can easily fall prey to like, oh, oh, I need to I need to keep going or like it feels like a competition versus a shared journey. Um, and so to then like encourage I notice that when I like encourage or I like, if I say, um, if I use my words for affirmation Mm. towards those that I know that I could easily like be pitting myself against, even like people I love, right? Because I'm like, you know, then it changes my posture, like open handed, like, you know, like, oh, this is beautiful. What you did is beautiful instead of, you know, uh, type of thing. So being able yes. to encourage instead of um, try to compete against being a cheerleader for people instead of a naysayer. And that's really beautiful. And you do that so well, both for your family and the Dahlia community. You've mentored lots of my friends in the Dahlia community, and that's how I came to know of you. So I know that it doesn't sound like there's maybe an exact timeline, but what does the future look like for your flower farm? <laughs> um, so if 
if, you know, when your children are young, it's a physical exhaustion. But when you're like any person who's listening to this, if you have anyone who is like has mothered through the the teen years, they would be like, yep. Like the teen years are something um, that they just take more. They take more emotional, mental, spiritual energy to give to them. And so, um, so I, I'm, I'm going to graduate, you know, like I, I don't know fully because like I said, my oldest has, has some different genetic stuff that we're still trying to work out and she's a junior. And so we'll like, there's that part, that journey. I have a freshman, you know, and I'm, I homeschool, I homeschooled them all up until high school and I'm still homeschooling my youngest. And so I think I'm taking my own advice by, um, saying yes to a few things. So, um, this year is to look at my list of dahlias that I have and to really, I don't want to be known by having 5,000 varieties, you know, like you only have so much space to breed. Right. And so like really going, you know, that, that, that dahlia is not going to serve the purposes for my plans of hybridizing. And so I'm going to really focus in on that if that's what I want to focus in on. So that means I have to eliminate varieties um, and be more strategic that way. So that, um, so I think that's like really where I'm going to focus in on and, um, and do that and then be involved. I'm, I'm, I'm the vice president of my Dahlia society. So helping out getting things, a little updated and more current in the 21st century. Um, and so doing that. And then um, I do I do oversee a Dahlia Roundtable. I'm going into my third year where I like facilitating and mentoring and stuff like that. Um, and we'll see. Like I, I'm working with a job coach myself, life coach, and seeing if I want to um, – maybe I just – maybe I want to pivot and I don't really want to go full into – make my business more breeding and then actually do something else completely that like with people. Um, cause I, I, I love to work with people. So. Well, you know. have a gift for that and you've shared so many life tidbits and lessons with all of us today. I know I've gleaned so much. Um, I was almost moved to tears a couple of times oh. while you were talking today. So um, I really love what you've shared with us. I do want to ask, because I know we talked about the breeding and then we kind of veered away from it. Can you give us any hints about a couple of your favorites that you've bred? What do they look like? What are the forms that you are? I know you mentioned the water lilies. Do you have a water lily yet? No, because last summer was my first summer where I isolated them. Okay. Um, so my very first year... I have one, only one from my very first year. Um, and that one is, <laughs> that one takes forever for it to grow, it would seem. So we'll see how that went. It's really lovely. It's just, it takes forever for it to like bloom. Um, and then I had, I had, I, I had some and they, and they like we had moved. So we lived actually just down the road and I had to start a whole new garden space. And it's, it's, that's difficult, right? Like it's mm-hmm. just difficult. It's hard to do. Um, so I had a couple and then some of them, like some of my, one of my favorites like died, the tubers died. It was like mm-hmm. gorgeous and wonderful. Right. But it died. Um, and so I have one going to its fifth year, a three, going into its fourth, their fourth year, I think, or fourth. Yeah. Something. I don't, I don't know. I'm like, cause it's like, you kind of like narrow it down. You're like, keep cutting it. And then, um, and so there's one, I showed my friends. It's like, the form is really great. The stems are sturdy. It makes really great tubers. Um, the angle, it's a 45 degree angle. Like all of those are really great. I, I, I'm always, I'm kind of like, uh, do I introduce it? Because the coloring is not like, I, I think I had a goal that I would want it to be able to be in the ADS book because I felt like it, it would bring like, see, I'm valid. Like it's, you know, it's not just me saying that something's beautiful, but it's being validated by other people who know mm-hmm. what they're talking about, not just someone on online who, you know, like, yeah, that's gorgeous. I'm like, but do you have a discriminating eye? Right. You know? Yes. Um, 
And so I don't know. I will I'll see. But I think I it, it's like the colors are great. It's just more of designer, like more a flower. It's not I don't think the colors would meet ADS standards cuz they they bleed a little like and they what like colors? It, It's it's well, it changes its color. It's. I'll have to send you a picture. It's. Um, we'll include it in the show notes if you send it to me. Okay, um, but it's. It's like a. It's a. I don't even know how to. It's a light blend. It would be a light blend. Okay. So yeah, but um, it made a massive amounts of tubers. I was like, oh my gosh, I have like forty five tubers of this thing. Like, it's oh my just, gosh, <laughs> like because I also the thing is is I I did it in a pot tuber. And so uh-huh. it's not, I'm not like, there's some people where they will take cuttings of their varieties. I'm not going to do that unless it's like something I really love. Um, but I just haven't done that. And so that means that my tuber production is a little bit slower than some other people that I know who are hybridizing where they like take cuttings after the, maybe the first year and then they're mot- multiplying their stock. So that's kind of where there's there's some really nice ones from this last year, but they're first year seedlings, so I don't put too much hope into it <laughs> until I see, you know, like yes. so really like, and I have um I feel pretty strongly about waiting four years for it to grow out until um, I do anything with it, just because um, that's how it used to be with ADS, um, because a lot of changes would happen between year three and four, and that would be also one thing that I would I would really hope that. Um, one thing with hybridizers when they go through ADS, they kind of know that it's gone through enough years. But mm-hmm. when, like with our world and how it is, is any any anyone can do it because if you have a website, you could just sell your your dahlias, which is great. Um, but there isn't that transparency on how many years it's grown. And so I've even seen um, ones where like people like I contacted someone like, oh, how many years? They're like, oh, it's only grown out two years. I was like, oh, that's not like that those genetics aren't quite secure. Um, so I would love, I would encourage people if you're going to start, um, hybridizing and selling, like to say, I've grown this one out for this many years. Like, cause I just think there's a transparency thing of like, yep, it's not just something that after two years now I'm selling it. Right. And especially because you can sell them for when they're going for like $40. It's so much. Yeah. Really? So now, when you say four years, do you mean that it has grown in your field for four years? And so the fifth year is when someone sells it or after three years, that fourth growing season can be sold? So eight, yeah. So four, yeah, four seasons, right? It really would be four seasons. So four summers. Um, ADS now says that it can be, you know, growing out for three seasons and by the fourth season, you know. I'm just going to go ahead and be a little bit more cautious because I just, I really want to be able to send out really quality stuff um, that will last. Um, And so I'm going to go ahead and be more conservative when it comes to that. Cause if my name is going to be behind it, I want it to be that way for, for people Um, and ever it teach their own. Right. And so, but like really at least, at least three seasons to really take note because, um, yeah, because oh, genetic, the genetics yes. are wonky. And I've heard from, I've heard from breeders where they've had it change even going into the sixth year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, that's, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. That's an outlier, I feel like, but you know. Well, yeah, I learned quickly because my first year from those floret seeds, I had one that, well, I had two that I kept. One made it to the third year. And it was this really light, pale lavender that was really pretty. And it was a ball, but it went from being really strong and sturdy in its second year to a total bobblehead Ugh. on every single plant in the third year. So I culled all of them. Isn't Someone sad. said, won't you give them to me? And I was like, no, I don't want my name attached or I don't want to put something out into the world. And then the other one, I was so excited. It was like this unique, I talked about in another podcast episode too, where it was like all these spotted colors. It kind of looked like something from Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And so I took it, divided it. I think it gave me like five or six tubers the first year. And I propagated that. So I had like 30 plants the second year. And I will never do that again because it changed so much into that second year. They were all blown centers, not a single closed center. And they were bobblehead. So like you said, with the genetics changing, I was like, okay, I'm not wasting my field space until Mm -hmm. I know if this genetics are stable. 
Yeah. And then I'll give it the space it deserves so I can grow it out and share it with the world, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it would have to be one of the most fantastic blooms that you ever saw, I think, to propagate after the first year. Like the most fantastic. That mm-hmm. That's the way – because I'm just like, why waste that time or that space? Like real right. estate – a garden real estate is big, so why would I waste my space and my time doing yes. that? And you know, the other thing I would say is don't rely upon Instagram or Facebook people like followers to tell you if if you're um, if you're hybridizing if it's a good flower or not. Like, actually ask. You know, like like you know, if you're sh- you're you're shopping for clothes, you want the friend <laughs> who will tell you the truth. Yes. Not the person who's just going to fluff you up. It's like if I bring my youngest, she has this gift to be like, to be encouraging, but also setting it, like setting it like it is. Mm -hmm. If I try something on and I'm like, what do you think about this priest? And she's like, you know, it's just not my favorite. I think you could do better. Like, you know, it's like really kind, but, but if it's good, she's like, oh yes, yes. And so someone who will tell you the truth. You need people who will tell you the truth. So. And that's what we're going to get from you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I love it. I love that. That's one of the things I love about you is that you you really prioritize what's important. And it's so evident in the little interactions I've had with you is you care about those that you mentor, you care about your family, you care about your community. And I think that's a really special gift that you bring to the Dahlia world as well. So thank you for being you yeah, and thanks. for joining us today. Before we wrap up, I have two last questions for you. The first question is for those that have now discovered you for the first time and would like to learn more about you, Camille, where can they find you? Most likely is whether it's in person, you can come to the Whatcom County Dahlia Society meetings held every first Tuesday of the month um, at the Laurel Grange. I like I love in person more. Um, but if it's online, you can probably go to my, you can go to my website, camillesflowers.com and that's Camille with a K and then, or Instagram. Um, I also have a Facebook, but I'm not on there as much. Like I have a page, so, but it's Camille's flowers. So perfect. We will provide show links to all of those so people can connect with you. And my last question, I always love to end each show with asking what advice would you leave our listeners with today? I guess my best piece of advice would be let your yes count Mm -hmm. and remembering that people are always more important than things, even Dahlia's. That's it. That's beautiful. Thank you. And happy Mother's Day to you. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day to you as well. Thank you. And to all of our listeners who are mothers or mentors, Mm -hmm. happy Mother's Day. I hope you feel celebrated this year. Thank you for joining us. Are you starting your Dahlia growing journey this season? Join the Dahlia Patch, a nurturing online community where new and aspiring Dahlia growers thrive. Get access to expert advice, step-by-step guides, and connect with a supportive network of gardeners. Dive into a community that helps you grow with confidence this season. Learn more by visiting the link in today's show notes. Thank you, flower friends, for joining us on another episode of The Backyard Bouquet. I hope you've enjoyed the inspiring stories and valuable gardening insights we've shared today. Whether you're cultivating your own backyard blooms or supporting your local flower farmer, you're contributing to the local flower movement, and we're so happy to have you growing with us. If you'd like to stay connected and continue this blossoming journey with local flowers, don't forget to subscribe to The Backyard Bouquet podcast. I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment to leave us a review of this episode. And finally, please share this episode with your garden friends. Until next time, keep growing, keep blooming, and remember that every bouquet starts right here in the backyard.